So welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Garrison Institute Forum series on Pathways to Planetary Health. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of jo the Garrison Institute, and today it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Joanna Macy. Joanna is an environmental activist, a deep ecologist, a scholar of Buddhism, and of systems thinking. She's long been a leader in the cultivation of ecological awareness and the resonance between Buddhist thought and postmodern science and the action that we need in the world today. As the root teacher for the work that reconnects, Joanna's created a groundbreaking framework for personal and social change that brings a new way of seeing our world as a larger body. She's a prolific author, and her many books include The World is Lover, World is Self, which you're redoing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Widening Circles, a memoir, uh, Act of Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy, and Coming Back to Life, an updated guide of the work that reconnects. And also, uh, there's a wonderful, uh, almost fresh rift for her work called A Wild Love for the World. She received her BA from Wellesley College in 1950 and a PhD in religion from Syracuse University in 1978. And she continues to write and teach in Berkeley, California. And we are so lucky to have you. Joanne has been a longtime friend of the Garrison Institute and she and her work is a great source of inspiration and wisdoms for the Pathways to Planetary Health community. We'll be on today for about an hour. So, um, please direct any questions to the Q&A box and we will get to those later. We're gonna spend a lot of time, we have a lot to talk about and then we'll get to your questions probably in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, you can write your questions earlier, but we won't, we're, not, we're not gonna pay as much attention to them earlier. So thank you and welcome Joanna. Hi. Hi. So, I'm glad to be here with you, Jonathan. Yeah, it's so great to be with you. We've had some really wonderful conversations. Um, so uh, we were just talking about the well-tempered clavier and that you got married in 1950 and you were listening to it. Oh, it was 53, 53. 53, yeah. 53. Anyway, right. it was practically our honeymoon was the well-tempered clavier. <laughs> so just to give us a, a brief over the early days of your work that with you and your husband together, where you traveled and, and how it began to influence you? Well, we began in, in uh, government service and uh, I was uh, working for the State Department and uh, Fran for, uh, he, he was working in Soviet affairs in a variety of, of uh, situations. And then we both left the, the ripe age, I was at the ripe age of, 23, and he, at the right age of 26 or five, uh, turned that all that experience behind and went into various forms of uh, uh, engagement with social change uh, on the ground with people. And, um, and that involved for the first, and that was the time we were building our family. And so it was a wonderful way for the children to see with their fresh eyes in this planet. We living with the American Peace Corps, um, not as, as um, volunteers, but as staff, because uh, in, in those days you couldn't have children, uh, anybody under 18 with you. So, uh, but we um, were in India for years, which had, and that, that then marked uh, in, in my uh, 20s still a huge, change in my life when I encountered refugees from the Chinese occupation of Tibet. Mm. And these refugees were uh, largely, almost predominantly uh, monks, lamas, and Rinpoches of the Tibetan tradition. And um, I uh, found myself with a Peace Corps volunteer engaged in spending more and more time with them up in the foothills of the Himalayas, helping them, uh, and we're helping them stay together with their communities and finding work that they could do and ways that they could keep their tradition. And I began to ache for the teachings hmm. because, but I saw that they were so, they were sick for one thing, 
uh, without having antibodies against the diseases of the low hot climates. And, and so I was just wanting to take care of them in any way I could. But I think that that was probably very good because I saw the teachings acted out mm -hmm. in their behavior and pretend when they were under stress, when their people were hungry, when, was, when they were, and, and just as long as I wanted to keep them together so that they could practice together. And that succeeded uh, mm -hmm. with their efforts, not my, <laughs> mine, but uh, so that some of them have, many of them, monasteries in India and now, oh my God, around the world. <laughs> so that was then, then we spent uh, time in, in um, years in Africa, North Africa, West Africa. And um, when we came back, I had, was holding this, what the impact of being with the Dharma and I did get some teachings. I wanted to go back to graduate school so uh, by then I was in my 40s, early 40s. And I found that that's a great time to go back to school because I had, uh, my mind was just an eager horse and I was wanting to charge in and I had learned to, to uh, use my time with split second choices of what I could do. <laughs> and so I had a marvelous time in that and uh, and and put what, what what changed my life was that uh, I did my doctoral work on uh, the teachings of the Buddha in, uh, before they split so that is in the pre-Theravada mm -hmm. uh, pre-Mahayana pre-Theravada and which you find in the uh, early discourses and early Vinaya. And then I was so struck by the importance he gave to his teachings on causality that I, uh, thanks to a blessing by his holiness, Karmapa, studied there at the same time, studied systems thinking mm -hmm. and systems theory. And I uh, could hardly contain myself with my excitement when I saw that the uh, this body of thought was the first developed body of thought since Buddhism that was nonlinear. And so it just, um, I've, it led me into following my heart into more action rather than uh, in the classroom. So I love being in the classroom. I've seen myself as a, a <laughs> teacher. And, uh, but so I've been co combining teaching with action in uh, working with people from uh, all ways of life and all kinds of backgrounds in how we see our world and how we see uh, what this thing is we call the self and how we see the relation between this self and its itches and ambitions and its uh, whining and its self-vaunting and its impatience and its self-pity and all that in relation to where we are and we're in this great living surround and I look out there and I see a yucca tree and a little beyond there, I see a uh, just uh, leaves all off the below, but the ginkgo tree now. But this is, these are my friends. Now, what am I in relation to that? And so that the, the um, Buddha and uh, the uh, early, the first generation of systems thinking, that answer so exquisitely, although one was science and the other was a way of wisdom, fit like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I have been yeah, uh, helping people feel that they belong here, finding ways how you can, put the, because that's your source. The source of who you are is this larger body. And when you read that little, um, what do I say? Uh, 
blurb on me um, that her work leads you to see the work, uh, our world as a larger body. It isn't a larger body, our larger body that we hope will help, we can be, help to remain as well tempered as possible. <laughs> Yeah, we need to we need to not cause our own sickness. It's so interesting because our language, the English language, <clears throat> is designed to divide us into separate atoms and to see our independence. And what you've described is actually a worldview which sees the true nature of reality, which is our deep and total interdependence. And when you talk about the Buddhist so causality, talk a little bit more. You said, so I was studying Buddhist the theory of causality. So describe the Buddhist theory of causality. Oh, oh yeah, well, that's the biggest thing. It's that it's, it's in um, all systems that grew up under the patriarchy, I might add, but you don't need to say that, but have see uh, causality or how things happen and how you can help things happen or make things happen is from orders from above. And so it's top down, right. or you could put it horizontally, is that it can be a linear sequence. A causes B and B has effect on C and C does that to D. And uh, but what if what A does to B affects A? Exactly. <laughs> what if what if what B's experience of what has happened with A changes A? Right. Yeah, and that just that that's it. That's this that simple nonlinearity, and and that uh, and so what's hard for so many Westerners to get, including the scholars themselves, and including spiritual teachers is that what's real then for the, the Buddha is what is change itself, their principles of change. But most religions in the patriarchal era have looked for change. Uh, what just doesn't change is real. Mm -hmm. So you look at something above time and then that has an effect down coming like that. Yeah. So we are, uh, <clears throat> we're having a wonderful time discovering that uh, we belong, we rediscover it. It's more beautiful because so many of us have been um, conditioned by linear thinking. Right. And so when we see, when we begin to grok this mutual belonging, that I'm actually affected by the way you listen to me. This is exquisite to see. That it's like a, a dance, nothing has to say. And that's more fun for us all than if I look to see if, if you've totally comprehended me. That's not so interesting as to see what you add or how the varied way you take it. It's like a musician and an audience. Uh, to play alone versus play to an audience, the feedback from the audience is, is, is a very different experience. Um, you know, what's interesting about this is so in, from the point of view of trying to create social or environmental change, there's a difference between trying to create the change and trying to create the conditions for the change and saying, well, if I'm gonna create the conditions for the change, then they, the right thing will emerge and I will co-create with it, I'll be part of it, but I'm not gonna determine what it is versus the more emphatic, I know what it is and I'm gonna go out and do it. Wow, that's beautifully put. Yeah, you can get louder and louder, big boss. Right. I told you. <laughs> so we actually, 
this goes so back to Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and others that the conditions of social, that social action um, as, so I, you know, well, we'll go there and then I wanna go somewhere else. But social action can be very frustrating when it's oppositional, partly because there's so much to oppose it will never end. So we need to do a mind shift with it to make it relational. And therefore there's an infinite amount of relationship to be rewoven together. This could not be more significant at this very moment. Now, right. after the impeachment, after the insurrection or instigation or whatever, that uh, and I'm practicing that mm -hmm. with a, a my oldest son who is uh, uh, he calls himself on the purple path and he's been um, following that before you hear it everywhere now but to bring the red and blue together and uh, it's uh, made it hard for some of us to listen to his views because he needs to persuade us. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, I, th I think that, that it's so incredibly important that we as a nation uh, get talking with and, and really curious and friendly with the, those who feel angry and shut out. Right. And, and um, and so too, and, and there are many, many ex, um, what, teachings now about that. And back, and of course, going back just as you started to go back. I'm just, uh, so go, uh, I, but I, I want uh, to, is it possible for something as loaded as a mother-son relationship for us to talk openly without having to win an argument? Yes, and I think what we're saying is that has to be, we have to expand that to the whole nation and maybe the whole yes. nation. Right. Um, so I want to go to a, a sentence you wrote in the afterwards to A Wild Love for the World. You said, Carl Jung once said that the core of each life's journey is one question that we are born to pursue. For me, that question is, how can I be fully present to my world present enough to rejoice and useful when we as a species are destroying it. So that's a really critical question and a great one to spend your life on because there is, it's not just that we as a species are, we're, we are destroying the ecological fabric and so many other, uh, you know, brother and sister species, but we are also destroying each other, the social fabric. Um, so how do you be present to that? Feel the pain, but, but not have the pain limit you and go on to the joy of transformation. Well, the big step, of course, is the, that initial one. To not distance yourself. To not, because you, that takes so much courage to not be afraid of it. So that then I realized, because this is what changed my life. When I thought I was going to be a university teacher and went into wherever it led me. But what led me was that question. And how, uh, because I saw that I had lots of data about an experience. To me, it was related to nuclear energy and waste production. But there was, it had, we had to stop giving some people cancer up and down the line. Mm -hmm. and, but to have anybody listen, and then to have anybody, once they heard it, actually take it in. So I thought, realized that we were numbing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a bad thing that the, uh, our whole, um, corporate capitalists or our, our whole in, industrial growth society 
the need to keep going uh, and to be part of the team, it numbs you out and makes you dependent on all the goodies. It's very, and to, and what was like that sentence, the, the subtitle, how to, how to see the mess we're in without going crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's what people literally thought. If I feel this, if I can actually allow myself to see, to imagine, or to feel, look, I, I, I've got a job to keep. I've got children to feed. I can't fall apart. I would, I'd, I'd be silenced. I would be stuck in despair for the rest of my life. And that's what so many people feel. They certainly did back then 40 years ago. And it's not, not any easier now. So that uh, to all you need to do, actually it's the simplest thing, is to uh, turn toward it gently, or maybe roughly, <laughs> but to oh. turn toward it and, and, and let and listen to it just for a minute. Just let it speak through you or let it feel through you. And this is what we started uh, in the first years that led to so much. It, it was called despair work. Mm. And what we found was, because uh, the, the Buddhist thing was so helpful, because the Buddha would say, it's only a feeling. It's not you. It's just a feeling. And so that's what the Buddhist teaching on the self, that the self is just a, a meeting place. It's just a, it's a stream. Hmm. Yeah. And you this, know, then, yeah, you're, then you're free. So it's freedom. You can be progressively free as you see that your pain for the world is actually releasing you into action. Wow. If you're not afraid of it, it turns, it reveals that it comes not from craziness, which people kind of think, many still, it comes from caring. Right. And that caring is rooted in our mutual belonging. Right. And so we can move from a society that is careless to careful. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. That's going to help me in my new career. So... Uh, you call this work the great turning. Yeah. So talk about the great turning um, and uh, holding actions in the structures and the shift in consciousness that the great turning includes. Uh, well, let me just place, well, uh, the way I see it is that we have three versions of reality yeah. uh, going on at the same time or stories, ways we understand. One is the uh, business as usual, uh, which uh, is kind of <clears throat> the industry, you've got to grow an economy and capitalism that's become globalized with corporate capitalism. And the se second view is, so that's what you hear from governments and, and, and um, military and the media and uh, more, not more and more, but along with other voices that are louder now. And the same is the, what we call the great unraveling because mm -hmm. this destroys the natural world right. and just our brother, sister species and ourselves. And then the alternative. So another thing you could want, try to get behind is the great turning. And so the great turning is a, 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 a revolution from the, our transition from the, uh, industrialized growth society to a life sustaining society. And that, and we have many efforts and successful innovations already going so much there that we can that, uh, demonstrate that it's right there. We can move into it uh, if we aren't afraid and, um, uh, and that actually uh, that there's sort of three ways you can participate in it. 
but you're particip participating in it, uh, in what you're writing and the conversations that you're uh, leading. And maybe you uh, um, uh, re re recycle your trash, so you're participating in it, you know. You, so yes, I try and do that through my work too. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. So, and, but, then, and then there's the there's uh but you it's there's these ways is one is to slow down the destruction right. of the industrial growth society. Yes. And that's a lot through mili um political actions, mm -hmm. what's called activism. And also direct actions, trying to save the water, protect the water, save the trees. Uh, right, but so. And then there's the mental, spiritual yes. shift that's in it, which is to discover who you are or what moves through you. Discover, uh, it's a shift in consciousness. So it seems to me, though, that the shift in consciousness has to permeate the direct actions. That if the direct actions are taken from an old mechanistic worldview, then um, although they may be actions for better, um, uh, they're perpetuating in the, the corrupted view that is creating the problem in the first place. Yeah. So that's why it's part of the... It's, those three, uh, the actions, the action and the wisdom, or action and the understanding, right? Is uh, and and the Buddha made that very very clear. Right. You know, he's, <laughs> he said, wisdom and action are like hands washing each other. Hmm. Each is no not. One is not more important right. than the other. Right. One doesn't come before because right. your action improves your wisdom. Right. You learn a lot in your actions. Right. So right. it's not sequential. Right. And my teacher used to say, it's like two sides of a piece of paper. They're like inseparable. Oh. From each other. Yeah. Oh, I like that. So talk more about wisdom. Tell us more about what is that wisdom that infuses the uh, compassionate action? The wisdom, uh, Manjushri, uh, it's the wisdom that uh, we are not uh, separate. There is no permanent separate self. Right. And that what does but there there is something you are certainly here and you're tangible and you're real and you eat and you want and you love and you hate and you're so all we need to do is, is that, that that's not permanent it's like a flowing river and so you can uh, see that what is what's the events in your body mind are uh, passing, and each one of these events is tied to interactively to the world around you. You're responding, you're thinking, you're walking, you're reaching out, you're signing a petition, you're thinking up a petition. It is part of a activity of the world itself and you, you're where you come in, what makes all the difference in your karma is where you see your choice. Mm. And you can build that choice. And you can build that intention. And they can, and the intention can grow until in the caring, you find that you want the well being of everybody. And you know that that's what's called the bodhicitta. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not yours. Bodhicitta is the happiness that comes up in you. That still is an experience when you find yourself 
experiencing it. Hmm. They feel that love coming through. But I love that you said it's not yours. No, you can't, and you can't use it to beat up on people. <laughs> no, you see then, so we, I, I'm feeling so much the need to unify or work toward overcoming the polarization in our society. And it won't be because I go to them and say, I want to love you. Right. I'm so loving, you know, Mrs. Virtue, I'm going to come and talk to you about unity. But to uh, come and say, tell me what you think. What do you see? I, want, I just want, I'd like to hear. Mm. Because you want them to see. Not, you want them to wake up, not see that you've woken up. Right. They want to be, and you want them to be unafraid to, to uh, stop blaming. Right. Mm. So you've talked about the power of gratitude to help with this. So talk about that. Yeah. You actually said that uh, gratitude protects you against self-pity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Self-pity is one of the <laughs> most boring things. I know anybody can fall into that. It just doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> And it doesn't taste good. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually, you know, basically, we've got to have to be to be real, to be effective, to be glad you're here. That's the basic thing. I feel I have to feel I'm glad I'm here. Right. And boy, do I. Yes. I feel glad to be here right this minute in this uh, stressed, divided country. Mm -hmm. it's, but uh, that's where I am, and I can love that. I love being alive. Yeah. I love it. And it's wonderful to love being alive when you have so many, you know, trunks full of mental trunks full of memories and unseen companions, but the every religion begins with being glad, especially your home religion. You know, uh, uh, the gratitude is such a declaration from the, the rabbinical wisdom that I've been exposed to. And, the, uh, and that opens you, otherwise, Gratitude makes you generous. Makes you generous with others and with yourself. Haven't you noticed that? Mm -hmm. And then if you're really glad to be here, which is my being gratitude, you don't have to be right all the time. Yeah. I think it's more cranky people who need to be right all the time. Haven't That's you? a hard one for me because I'm not cranky but I still want to be right all the time. So I got to work on that one. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, I've discovered too, that gratitude is subversive. Ooh. I hope you'll ask me why I think. So Joanna, why is, why, Joanna, why is gratitude subversive? <laughs> because it operates, it undermines the growth economy, the consumer society, which is get, delivering the message all the time that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you don't smell right, you don't have the right kind of car, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but you... Go, and go. so go. what do you do? You, you, you're feeling needier and needier. Gratitude means that you see yourself as essentially uh, well-resourced, even if you only have a crust of bread, but you're not, you're not feeling as needy as the capitalist system would like. Yeah. Now, 
another layer of that is that you said to me, gratitude opens the valve of energy and dissolves the walls of the self. So, um, so, so in, in a way, what it's, you're saying is that it may um, disassociate you with the external things you're being told you want, and it can connect you to a vast realm of energy um, that when you dissolve the, the, the walls of yourself, then you have everything. Because you that's what you are. Uh how much time do we have? We have 20 minutes and tons of questions that- Oh, people, can I? Oh, for the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, no, people, right. people just writing and writing questions and questions, but don't worry, we're gonna get them. I want you to finish and we can go over a little bit longer too. Okay, well, let me just tell you what the, the self that I wanted to okay. see. If, yeah. uh, I had an experience that changed my life. I was up, was going up to get teachings finally from my Tibetan mentor. Right. Finally, I was getting on a train. It was an overnight train up to the hills without the kids. So I thought, oh, I can handle it. And I was just without the children. I'll take a third class ticket. And I was assigned a, a top tier of wooden tier of three ranks of and went down to get on the train. And it was a mob scene, uh, was just, uh, and terrifying. And uh, the I almost got dismembered in the crowd being pushed in, and me with my jug of water and my knapsack. And they then threw me up on the top tier, and I sat there terrified, and not to, I'm just, I, I knew I'd be okay, but uh, I wanted to exclude and forget everything else. And so I was glad the lights were still on. It was a night train. I could read the book I was reading. So the family below kept thrusting up chapatis to me and I, no, no, melting banana, no, and just read. And I happened to be reading uh, about the teaching of the self. And and it was in a Peace Corps book locker for the volunteers that I'd lifted this out by Houston Smith. Mm -hmm. And he said, his line said, and there is that, that we are always identified. We are just carrying this around. This is, we hope strap, it's like a little donkey. We strap all our hopes and all our self-criticisms and all our worries and all our problems and, our, and all our ambitions on this little burrow. And this is, and, and as the lights flicker, I just put down the, that for a moment and began breathing bigger breath as if I was going to be going down some a race right from the highest peak at San Anton. And I open my eyes and I look in the whole crowded car carriage of this shaking train in the night on this third class train and the people on the floor and the crying babies and that coughing heap of rags and something, my heart, where I live, just popped, seems to, that sounds mm -hmm. like a popcorn where everything that was inside me popped open and everything that was on the outside came in. It was an experience where absolutely everything within the reach of my senses was most intimately me, and everything that was most intimately me had now uh, included the whole world. But here I was with the heart, with this third class carriage and these uh, When I could think, because this was almost all physical, emotional, when I could think, my first thought, Jonathan, were three words. 
released mm -hmm. into action. Now I can be released into action. I don't have to think. I don't have to decide. I don't have to. Um, I am action. That's me. It's not just something I do. I am that. I never got over the, but I, 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 I went up and, and it lasted most of the night. And I, then I got up and had to get on two buses and crowded and back in India again and up to the nunnery and did the, right. But the, the moment that was the most affecting my whole life was before I got up there mm. in on that situation that was so repellent to me. But it, you transformed it. Who did? You did, or your consciousness. You, you, oh, you. I may have failed. Well, something, or the great Buddha mind. Yeah. The little Joanna was cowering up there. Yeah. But, so that means that it's in the nature of reality. Mm. It's in the nature of reality for the decisions that you made, not because it's for... Uh, to, to do this program, to steer uh, Garrison in this way that you are, to draw the people you are drawing to Garrison, to hold the, the big-hearted ambitions you have to make this moment for our planet be powerful for us all. So I want to pass on to you, it's funny, I want to let that sit. Actually, I just want to let that sit and then I'm going to pass on to you some questions because it's so beautiful and it's actually is the presence you've been talking about. So there's a series of questions that have come in. One is, I am a climate change campaigner who has lost her motivation through a loss of hope. I've tried Joanna's method of turning towards despair and it has not translated into new mo motivation. Just a sense of wanting to do something less hopeless. What am I doing wrong? Honey, we, the thing is about climate change, we all have to wake up. So you're walking in, in the, this job you're in, to, given yourself is like shoes that are too tight. <laughs> Take them off. Go do something else. Make, make compost. You know, just, or just do, you know, because you're, you care. You will never get over your caring for this world, for this planet. It is in you. That's who you are. Whether you're, it, even when you're hopeless, that's who you are. That's why you're hopeless. So we could think of it as the great pearl of hopelessness because that shows how big your heart is. You know, so I, wanna, I think Planet would want you to say, uh, find something that lets you feel the world loving you back. Mm. So I want to tell you a beautiful story about that. You know, there's yeah. an incredible photographer named Sebastio Salgado. Oh, he went around the world taking extraordinary photographs yeah. of migrants and farmers and, and miners and war. And he shot the war in Kosovo and he shot uh, Ethiopia and the great famines. And, and he reached a point in the 1990s where he was completely burnt out from the decades of immersion and suffering. <clears throat> it turns out that his grandfather, had he grew up in Brazil and his grandfather had a farm. And his grandfather brought in cattle and overgrazed the farm to raise money to send his grandkids to educate, to college, to be educated. So when Salgado returned to his grandfather's farm, it was completely desiccated. It had been turned into a desert. All the trees and all of life was gone. And he was desiccated and he was completely burnt out. And with his wife and really inspired by his wife, Lila, they started planting trees. And as they planted the trees and they planted biodiverse trees, the ecosystems began to return. And within five years, the streams started to return 
And now there are hundreds of documented uh, different animals that have returned and they have, they've not only brought back the 1300 acres of his grandfather's farm and around it, but they're now doing the whole bioregion. So I think this is, I, I just give this as an example of when you're burnt out, make compost. Um, <laughs> you can make small compost and it can grow. And you have to put yourself in the state of regeneration. So when we're surrounded by so much degeneration, so I'm gonna quote you again, which is degeneration is the fraying of the fabrics of connection. And you told me in another conversation that you know complexity is about a fabric of connection. And we are disconnecting that fabric when we destroy the biodiversity, et cetera. So the climate change campaigner who's campaigning you're in a system that's, that's fraying and we need to find another posture where we are reconnecting. Does that make sense? I think there's one other thing I'd like to say. Yes, that's it. But, that, but it's okay, let it fray. I'm gonna let yourself because that's not who you are. Hmm. You have this bodhicitta, this motivation uh, to serve and save the pl life on this planet. I do too. But we may fail, honey. I don't know your name. But uh, allow that thought. There are planets where the arising of self-reflective consciousness, I'm sure, has arisen and is failing. Hmm. There, there are planets where life has gone out, we may be one of them. I often pray for the, the life on the planets that are going well to give us a hint um, to help us. But I think that it helps me with my flexibility and my um, presence uh, to acknowledge that it'd be um, arrogant to assume that uh, we will inevitably succeed just because we want to. But we can still, I think that even with, uh, if we fail and we can't go with the greenhouse gas emissions and the uh, predicted scenario unfolds that and we've complex life forms snuff out that we will in our efforts in our teamwork in the love that has guided it we will have reached uh, dimensions of collective intelligence and love that will have made it all worthwhile because we belong to each other. We have a beautiful, we're given a beautiful task. Even if we fail, we can love this task because it brings us together. And that's the point. You don't want to succeed and just be the only one there. <laughs> wow. And that might be the mindset, the only mindset that heals. So related to that, there's another um, question. When Joanna says, I need to just love what is, uh, you in part already answered this, but I want you to go deeper if you can. How do we love the incredible suffering that is rapidly increasing and the conscious efforts by elites and others to make it worse and worse so they can have more and more? And there are many questions that came that use this word elite. So I want you to, so I'm going to ask this again. When you said, how do, so how do we love the incredible suffering that is rapidly increasing and the conscious efforts by elites and others to make it worse and worse? Uh, you know about the bodhisattvas and the, um, 
in the Mahayana tradition, I've been very moved by uh, how uh, the celestial bodhisattvas, there's all of us being bodhisattvas when we care and, and work for others, but there's also the uh, celestial ones that represent capacities in our heart. And there's one that's uh, called um, uh, Jizo in, in Japan, and that is, um, mm, it'll come to me. I have, I forget easily at this age, but this um, Bodhisattva, uh, he uh, is known for helping the babies who would die and helping them traverse into the next stage of the next awareness. And he has many gifts. And his one of his gifts is that he is open to the suffering of his time. And, and the scriptures describe with awe that he has uh, ears and att attention that can hear the music of the spheres and the cries of the language of the birds. And by the same measure that he can take in the beauty and, and symphonic music of the spheres, he also can hear the moans and cries from the deepest levels of hell. He's that open. I'm wondering why I love him so much. And I think it's because some part of me must recognize that if you want to be open, you can't do it with just what you like <laughs> or what you admire or what makes you feel good. And it's, it's being refusing to be or being afraid of opening to what you don't like that uh, has caused so much numbness and greed and the, uh, opens the door to the uh, poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion. So you, you, you're born here. You don't have forever. You've got a certain amount of time. You've got these exquisite, sensitive perceptions, and you can take in this world around you. And you say, well, no, not that. I'll be interested in them, but not them. So to be with what is, to love what is, means that I will open myself to you. I guess that's it. I, to love what is doesn't mean I approve of you, but that I notice that you're, I, I will affirm that you're here. I won't check you out. I won't pretend you're not there. So I can see that my, what I said would be, uh, I do love what is, but that actually, I've got to work on that because loving what is, is actually what I mean. Mm. But I, at the same time, I can see how confusing that would be. But it doesn't have to do, to do with approval, but it does have to do with loving your world so much that you, the, the, those that are hurt and those that seem to do the hurting and and the ones I want to learn from are those that help me open to both. Hmm. So there have been many questions, by the way, which I think you just answered, which is, how do you deal with family members? A lot of people have said, I have family members who are Trump supporters or who are whatever, or on a, on a different side than I am. And, and uh, I feel such divisions with them. And how do I move beyond that or through that? And I think your answer is love. Yeah, well, I'll just, I, I'm feeling good now. And I, it's just started this week. <laughs> uh, but this week has been an incredible week for me. You see, I thought when I listened to the uh, president's uh, tirade before the mob, and then they all went off and I had to do, I had other meetings and I, when I thought, I thought he'd succeed. See, I, I lived in Germany right after the second world war 
And I know it, I know it can happen that you get the wrong, the people who want to destroy, uh, take charge. Yeah. So it's, I feel myself turned inside out. I feel myself uh, wanting to uh, work to hold the conversation open. I want to say, I, I find myself looking at the paper at the, the, mo the, the most uh, angry voices uh, on the other side because we only have a little time. That's in my mind. The main thing, I want to love these people so that we can lower, get, start working together so we can lower the grass. Oh, I said grass emissions. I meant <laughs> <laughs> maybe grass would be better. <laughs> um. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to change the tone a little bit and ask a different question. Um, do you have any sort of wisdom concerning how to balance the health and well being of whole systems and of individuals and the elements that constitute these systems? System science makes it clear that these are not always compatible. By the way, I'm not entirely sure, but that's true, that they may be mutually opposed, meaning that this is the question. The question is, Basically, how do you balance the health and indiv of individuals versus the health of the system? And it uh, says that focusing on individuals, compassion <laughs> may be at the detriment of the larger system, i.e. the biosphere. And I just want to throw into this a concept, an evolutionary concept called inclusive fitness. Uh, Are you familiar with it? Explain it. So the idea of inclusive fitness is that we evolve, okay, so think of fit, uh, the survival of the fittest. It's like, you know, the most powerful, right? Yeah. The survival of the fittest is those that fit together the best. So inclusive fitness is, think about vast mutuality and symbiosis, that actually the well-being of the individual component and components, you know, is already a a word, that a mental construct that divides things, but the parts in the whole, that they're, you started this by saying they have this mutual well-being. So this question, which is, how do you balance the individual? This question posits that the well-being of the individual and the well-being of the whole can be oppositional. Yeah, yeah, so the, uh, the whole understanding, it, it takes a little more time than we have right now to, to go into this. You know what? Go just the question, the person who asked the question, just think about holons. And then uh, if you're curious, start looking at the holographic view uh, of the universe or of anything of our culture, where the part is not that, or component is not only part of the whole, but includes the whole. And that, uh, so that what, what science and, and um, consciousness studies now are showing is that each one of us has information that we could not have gotten just um, biographically in this lifetime. That there is understandings about uh, our uh, phylogenetic sequences or the way of the universe is somehow in us. The world is inside us. Oh, I like that. I like that too. So you know what? <laughs> Talk about holons. What is oh, holon? Oh, mean? oh no. Yeah. No. Oh yes. I, I mean, no, I don't want to do it. It's okay. because it's, <laughs> you know yeah, what? We'll well, it's just that. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, you know what? I got an idea. We'll do it. We'll have another conversation, and we'll start it with holon. Oh, good. All right. I was hoping you'd ask me back. <laughs> I'm definitely asking you back. And uh, wow. So I think this has been a fantastic conversation. There's lots of questions that, um, ooh, you know, uh, there's so many good questions, but we've, co we've come to the end of our time. Uh, save uh, them. Yes, exactly. Let's save these. And 
Um, just one very quick one. Somebody said, could you repeat the Carl Jung quote about being useful? Was it from man and his environment? Was it? What? No. Oh. It was the Carl Oh, no. The, there was Carl. <laughs> I just was quoting him. He said, in every life, you find it doesn't come at the beginning necessarily. For me, it came in the middle of my life. There's a question that sums up seems to sum up who you are and, and, and in your life. And, 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 and that question uh, actually reveals your journey. And for, then I, the quote was my question, how do I live in a planet, on a planet uh, conscious enough to serve it and enjoy it? While at the same time, my species is uh, putting it out of, commission is destroying you yeah so do you, do you have a question no i'm going to bring us to a close because you already answered my question which is we're going to do this again we're <laughs> yeah. going to pick we're going to pick up here and keep going wow so joanna thank you so much it's so I love you. It's such a loving experience to be with you. Yeah. You're your amazing mind. Um, as a reminder to the audience, uh, so by the way, this is part of the Pathways to Planetary Health Forum, and you described exactly what is the essence the Garrison Institute view about what is the pathway to planetary health, which is that shift in consciousness of care and gratitude and love for the whole. You. I'm not going to repeat what you said. That is the shift in consciousness. These forms are offered for free. So if you'd like to support our programming, please consider making a donation to the Garrison Institute or sponsoring our next conversation. We have a number of exciting virtual events coming up, including a talk with Thomas Hubel on trauma and collective trauma, Dan Siegel on healing collective trauma and other things, Sharon Salzberg, just to name a few. Please visit our website calendar for a full listing and we hope you can join us again and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, they can hear us continue to talk. We're not, we're not signed off yet. So we're gonna 